June 13th here in Seoul and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with the South Korea-Kazakhstan summit. The leaders of the two countries vow to secure a stable supply chain for core minerals, with Astana's possession of abundant resources and Seoul's technology to process those minerals and manufacture chips and batteries. Russian leader Vladimir Putin will visit North Korea in the coming days, South Korea's top office says. This is the first time the government has confirmed such a move. The U.S. Federal Reserve is keeping its benchmark lending rate at its current level for the seventh time in a row. It's also indicating there will only be one rate cut in 2024. President Yoon Sogar says that things will really kick off for South Korea and Kazakhstan in terms of cooperation between the two countries. Yoon also wrapped up his Kazakh state visit with a cultural event on Wednesday. Our Kim do reports. Following the summit between South Korea and Kazakhstan on Wednesday, President Yoon Song yeol and President Kasim Jomar Tokayev joined a business forum in Astana to solidify summit discussions. President Yoon re-emphasized cooperation to stabilize the supply chain for critical minerals, with Kazakhstan possessing the necessary resources and South Korea having the technology to process those minerals and manufacture chips and batteries. <laughs> With 300 business leaders and government officials at the forum, 24 MOUs and agreements were also signed. Four of them were related to natural resources and energy cooperation, such as for searching for lithium and its development. Another MOU was about expanding Korean automobile companies' production in the Central Asian country. This is a field that the two countries are looking to expand cooperation as Kazakhstan is planning to develop its manufacturing capacity. The Kazakh president, noting that around 700 South Korean companies are already in the Kazakh market, emphasized the importance of South Korea's role in the global economy as a whole and vowed to support South Korean companies running business there. I am confident that today's forum will breathe new life into the synergy of cooperative efforts between the two countries. Today, we have also expressed our full support for Korea's K-Silk Road initiative in Kazakhstan. The two leaders put aside business afterward and shared cultural performances from the two countries, symbolizing the long-standing relationship and shared history between the two countries. With around 600 people in the audience, the performers included more than 100 Korean and Kazakh artists. Among the Kazakh artists were Korea Saram or ethnic Koreans in Central Asia who performed Korean traditional dances. Kim Do-yeo, Arirang News. And experts cannot stress enough how attractive Central Asian countries like Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan are as partners of Seoul, particularly in the fields of natural resources and energy. Our Song Yoo Jin tells us more. South Korea aims to strengthen its economic cooperation with Central Asian countries that possess rich energy reserves and natural resources. Those countries include Turkmenistan, which has the world's fourth largest natural gas reserve, and Kazakhstan, which ranks 12th in the world for oil, according to a recent report by the Korea International Trade Association. And according to one expert, countries in Central Asia have even bigger potential. They have abundant minerals, including uranium, tromium, titanium, and more. Those countries also have a stable supply chain to export these resources. There are still lots of undiscovered resources in the Caspian Sea, and as the situation in the Middle East is unstable, we need a new stable source of crude oil, and Kazakhstan can be it. The expert added that a growing population and GDP also make Central Asia attractive. 
Despite this, economic exchanges between South Korea and Central Asia have been comparatively small. According to a recent report by Kita, the value of imports from Central Asia to South Korea came to around 3.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2023, down 25.3 percent on year. The total investment input to countries in Central Asia from Seoul from 1980 through 2023 was $3.8 billion. That's only about 2 percent of the total investments in the U.S. during the same period. An expert gave his explanation as to why exchanges have been so limited. First of all, uh, geography is a barrier for us uh, because we are not immediate neighbors. And second of all, I think uh, geopolitics is not uh, in our favor because uh, Korea is divided and the Central Asian countries are landlocked and uh, uh, surrounded by countries which are uh, sanctioned uh, by the West. And that's why President Yoon seok is currently in Central Asia to strengthen economic relationships with countries there. It's very important uh, for leaders to come together, to be in the same room and to talk about uh, agendas of both sides. Uh, for example, for Kazakhstan, it is very important uh, to, uh, to switch from uh, resource-based development to a uh, more value-added uh, version of uh, production, industrial, uh, uh, you know, uh, building industrial facilities, etc. Collaboration is the key for both sides to succeed in very important venture because we are living in a very difficult world. Several MOUs that could bolster economic partnerships between Korea and countries in Central Asia have already been signed during President Yoon's visit. Watchers will be focusing on whether South Korea can broaden economic cooperation even further, particularly for energy and natural resources. Song Yujin, Arirang News. South Korea's top office says that in the next few days, Russian leader Vladimir Putin will travel to North Korea. As the visit would take place around the same time as the newly established diplomatic and security dialogue between Seoul and Beijing, a high-ranking president official said the top office will take such factors into full consideration and work rigorously throughout Yoon's Central Asia trip to ensure South Korea's major allies and strategic partners are aligned with Seoul on the North Korea issue. This marks the first time a South Korean official has confirmed the news. Following unverified reports that Putin will travel to North Korea and Vietnam in the coming weeks, amid suspicions of weapons and oil exchanges between Pyongyang and the Kremlin. And the issue of North Korea as a human rights took center stage at the UN Security Council on Wednesday, with South Korea chairing the meeting as the rotating president this month. Lee seung has the details. Last August, the UN Security Council held a meeting to discuss North Korea's human rights violations. A meeting to discuss such issues at the UNSC at the time was the first of its kind in six years as Seoul, Washington and others shed light on the fact that Pyongyang has been using its scare resources to fund its weapons of mass destruction programs instead of helping the heavily impoverished people of North Korea. Fast forward 10 months later to Wednesday, where under the rotating presidency of South Korea, the UNSC once again convened a meeting in New York to bring to attention the plight of North Koreans and its security implications. South Korea's ambassador to the UN, Hwang Jung-guk, presiding over the open meeting, stressed that the North Korean regime wants to keep the people in the dark and try to repulse the outside light with their draconian control and nuclear weapons. He further emphasized that if human rights violations stop in the reclusive state, nuclear weapons development will also stop, adding that the global community needs to look at North Korea's human rights situation from the perspective of international peace and security. The meeting, however, was met with opposition from North Korea's traditional allies in China and Russia. The Russian ambassador to the UN slammed the meeting, saying that while the global community looks toward the UNSC with the hope that it will resolve complicated global issues, it is squandering resources on a discussion of groundless and blatantly politicized matters. China's ambassador to UN reiterated Beijing's stance that the council is not the proper venue to address human rights issues.
Before the start of the meeting, 57 UN member states and the delegation of the European Union issued a joint statement calling on all UN members to work together to bring concrete change that will improve the lives of North Koreans and contribute to a more peaceful and secure world. Lee seung Arirang News. U.S. key interest rates stay frozen at the current level. The Federal Reserve announced the decision on Wednesday and hinted at just one rate cut this year. Our Park kwan tells us more. The U.S. Federal Reserve has maintained its benchmark interest rates once again and is forecasting fewer rate cuts to happen this year than earlier predicted. In a two-day Federal Open Market Committee meeting which ended on Wednesday local time, the committee decided unanimously to keep key interest rates at the 5.25 to 5.5 percentage range. This was the seventh consecutive meeting where the Fed has kept its interest rates at the same level, the highest since 2001. The gap between South Korea's interest rates remained the same with a two percentage point difference. The Fed's decision came after U.S. Labor Department released its consumer price index for May earlier in the day. The CPI in May saw an on-year increase of 3.3 percent, slowing down 0.1 percent from the previous month. Core CPI, excluding volatile food and energy prices, was up by 3.4 percent on-year, which was 0.1 percent lower than previous estimates. Though Fed Chair Jerome Powell called the recent inflation report a good reading, he said it would take longer to get the confidence needed for the Fed to loosen its policy. The most recent inflation readings have been more favorable than earlier in the year, however, and there has been modest further progress toward our inflation objective. We'll need to see more good data to bolster our confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent. Also on Wednesday, the Fed predicted that there could be a single rate cut before the end of the year. That's different from its forecast made in March, when three rate cuts were predicted. As there are four FOMC meetings left in 2024, watchers are now focusing on whether the Fed will cut interest rates before the presidential election in November. Park go Arirang News. So yet another rate freeze from the U.S. Central Bank. Let's talk more about what's behind the latest decision with Professor Greg Butchuk. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. So, Professor Butchuk, what are they waiting for? Why another rate freeze? Sure. Well, the, the Fed's objective here is to balance inflation against full employment. And throughout this cycle, the labor market has remained incredibly strong. Mm. Inflation has also remained stubbornly high. So this is sort of what led the Fed to raise rates and keep them high in the first place. Uh, this morning, U.S. time, we had a very encouraging inflation report with, uh, with core CPI inflation number showing a monthly increase of about 2 percent annualized. So from last month to this month, uh, it was 2 percent. Um, that's exactly actually the Fed's target. So that, that's really good news. Uh, the markets kind of celebrated this as a green light for the Fed to start rate cuts in the future. Uh, but given that inflation is just touching the Fed's target and unemployment remains low, the Fed didn't have a strong reason to cut today. Uh, instead, the debate is more around when the Fed will start cutting and how quickly they'll cut. Right. And when asked what will help inflation reach the Fed's target of, you know, 2 percent, the ultimate goal, Powell said slower inflation will come from where it's been coming from. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, so, so Powell said this uh, in the context of sort of trying to understand what's been causing inflation to slow down and what will continue to slow it down in the future. Mm -hmm. Further on in that quote, he, he sort of points to the unwinding of pandemic-related distortions, both in terms of supply and demand. Okay, so the big drivers of lower inflation have been reduced costs of goods and energy. These prices spiked during the pandemic because supply was disrupted. There was a lot of, a lot of trouble with the supply chains. While at the same time, the government engaged in a lot of stimulus that just put more money in people's pockets. And so when there's more money chasing fewer goods, that causes prices to increase. What Pal meant is that he expects the reversal of these trends to continue in the future. And then sort of when looking at what's contributed to lower inflation, almost all major categories have been trending down with the exception of shelter, actually. So housing and rental costs, these are still elevated. And what's kind of interesting here is that these prices tend to move much slower so I would expect, actually, prices here to move down in the future as well. So it looks like we're going to see uh, rate cuts, not three, not two, but just one only. Professor Butcher, what's your take on this? 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, today we had a really encouraging inflation report. And in the time between that report and the Fed's statement, markets were sort of nearly certain there would actually be two rate cuts this year. So the Fed sort of surprised markets by projecting only one rate cut. And in fact, actually, some people at the Fed still expect no rate cuts this year. So I think there's really two reasons the Fed disagreed with the market consensus going into this. First is on the labor market side, which is sort of the other half of the Fed's objective. Last week, we had a really strong jobs report with almost 300,000 new jobs. The unemployment rate was coming in at 4%, which is very low. And this strong labor market means there's no really rush on the Fed's part to start cutting rates. And then second, and this is a, as Chairman Powell said, today's inflation report was just one data point. It's true, there's been a lot of data kind of pointing towards inflation cooling. This was actually the first report that really showed the Fed hitting its target. And given that this is just one data point, I think there's still some uncertainty and it makes sense for the Fed to sort of err on the side of making sure inflation is consistently at their target rather than risk reinflation uh, from rate cuts. So when you sort of put this all together, there's some uncertainty on the inflation side. And given the strong labor market, the Fed really has space to take things slow. Professor Butcher, you briefly mentioned this. We have to talk about the timing of an upcoming mm. rate cut. Now, a lot of market analysts are predicting one rate cut will come before the presidential election in November. Now, why before the election? Sure. So you know, there, there are two meetings before the election, one in July, one in September. If economic trends continue, I think there's a decent chance the Fed will cut in at least one of these meetings, um, probably more likely in September. Mm -hmm. So my view on this is the decision is going to be based on economic factors like we've discussed, trading off inflation versus unemployment. It's not going to be a political decision. People often sort of have this idea that the Fed will be political uh, when it suits uh, those people's narratives. So in this case, a rate cut before the election, it would stimulate the economy, it would make people feel more optimistic, and this would benefit President Biden. So if the Fed does cut shortly before the election, I think you'll likely see some Trump supporters sort of accusing the Fed of being political. And likewise, if they don't cut, I think some Biden supporters may say the, the same thing. The truth is the Fed actually has a really strong track record of being apolitical. They care a lot about being apolitical. And so whatever the decision the Fed makes, it's going to be based off of economics and, and not politics. Before I let you go, Professor Butcher, briefly, does that mean the Bank of Korea will not slash its interest rate until this fall when the U.S. Fed is expected to? Yeah, I think a lot of countries tend to follow the Fed's cue on monetary policy because an asynchronous rate cut sort of puts a lot of pressure on foreign exchange markets. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the rate of inflation in Korea is still a bit above the long-term target. So sort of based on these two things, I think there's no big rush to cut. Given that the U.S. cut is probably only a few months off, I think Korea can, can wait until that happens. All right, Professor Buchuk, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You enjoy your evening there. Thanks for having me. The European Union on Wednesday announced it will impose additional import tariffs of up to 38.1% on Chinese electric vehicles. The EU said subsidies given to EV makers by China keep prices artificially low and distort the European market. Now, under the plan, the bloc will apply five tariff levels from July 5th, with car makers that cooperate with investigators facing additional tariffs of 21 percent and those who do not face an additional 38.1 percent. The charges come on top of an existing 10 percent tax on cars imported into the EU, and the announcement could lead to talks with China to avoid a possible trade war, as the EU must decide by November if it will adopt the tariffs permanently. As the first BTS member to finish his mandatory military service on Wednesday, Jin is ready to return to his fans. He'll be giving out hugs to excited Army members at an event today. Our Cha yung Yang has more. Jin of K-pop group BTS was discharged from the Army on Wednesday morning after serving as an assistant instructor in the 5th Infantry Division's boot camp. As soon as Jin walked out of the camp, he saluted a small number of fans and reporters and then greeted other members of BTS who had taken military leave to celebrate his discharge. 
Suga was the only member missing as he's performing alternate service. On Thursday, Jin is scheduled to attend 2024 Festa at Jamsil Indoor Gymnasium in Seoul and meet with the BTS ARMY fandom to celebrate the 11th anniversary of the boy band's debut. Jin is expected to give out hugs to up to 1,000 fans at the first part of the event amid other programs for the ARMY later. Expectations for BTS comeback as a group are growing after Jin completed his military duty. Among other BTS members still serving in the military, J-Hope will be the next to be discharged in October. Cha Yoong-kyung, Arirang News. Good morning, I'm Kim si young and now we turn off to stories from around the world. The U.S. has announced new sanctions on Russia ahead of the G7 summit in Italy as four Russian military vessels, including a Navy frigate and a nuclear-powered submarine, arrived in Cuba in what is seen as a show of force. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, aboard Air Force One en route to Italy, told reporters that more than 300 new sanctions were being introduced, largely focused on deterring Russia from obtaining key technologies through individuals and companies from countries such as China, the UAE and Turkey. Meanwhile, only 150 kilometers from the U.S. soil, a fleet of Russian Navy vessels reached Cuba after conducting high-precision missile weapons training in the Atlantic Ocean. A U.S. official speaking to the Associated Press called it a routine port call that posed no threat to the United States. However, Russia's visit is seen as a show of force, as well as a reminder that Russia has allies in the region, including Cuba and Venezuela. Now to Kuwait, where at least 49 people died and 50 more were injured on Wednesday in a fire at a building housing some 195 foreign workers in the city of Mangaf. According to reports, 42 Indian nationals died, with migrant workers from Egypt, Pakistan, the Philippines and Nepal also among the casualties. A Kuwaiti police official said that the cause of the fire in the six-story building is unclear, but the presence of more than 20 cooking gas tanks in the overcrowded block caused the fire to spread quickly. Kuwaiti Deputy Prime Minister Sheikh Fahad Yusuf Saud Al Sabah blamed building code violations and the greed of real estate owners for the fire during a visit to the site on Wednesday. Forensic police say most of the fatalities were caused by suffocation. In Argentina, riot police on Wednesday used water cannons and tear gas to disperse protesters outside the country's Congress ahead of a vote on proposals by President Javier Millet. Thousands of protesters gathered in downtown Buenos Aires to urge lawmakers to reject Millet's agenda of economic deregulation and harsh austerity. Amid the chaos, senators began debating a tax reform that lowers the income tax threshold and a 238-article state reform bill. Outside the Congress, demonstrations started as a carnival atmosphere but became more violent with police water cannons and tear gas used against protesters who threw Molotov cocktails at bikes and cars on the streets. Police reported that 15 protesters were arrested and at least 20 police officers were injured. U.S.-based Bark Air the dog-friendly airline that announced its maiden flight in May has added five new destinations to its portfolio. The company said Wednesday that it will now offer flights to Paris, France and expand its domestic service to Chicago, San Francisco, Phoenix and Miami. That's in addition to its current services to New York, Los Angeles and London. The Dog First airline provides services such as speedy check-ins, doggy champagne and options for an on-flight spa experience.
Good morning. The midsummer heat wave continues to blast across much of Korea, with more regions under heat advisories. But at least those in the East Coast regions, including Gangneung, will get nice relief from the searing heat this afternoon. But the rest of the country needs to brace for season's hottest temperatures this afternoon under burning sunshine. Northern parts of Gyeongsangbukdo could see 5 to 20 millimeters of passing showers. Meanwhile, have sun protection items during the hottest parts of the day. Bright sunshine will boost UV rays to very high levels. Please pay attention to the risk of hot and sunny weather if you have to work outside today. Seoul gets up to 32 degrees Celsius. Gyeongju and Gwangju will make it to 34 degrees. But those of us in the capital area need to prepare for even hotter temperatures for tomorrow before heat relief comes on Saturday. And next week should not be as hot as this week. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.